Hi, I'd just like to talk about NOEs in NMR, NMR spectroscopy. Um, NOEs were first proposed in 1953 by this guy, Albert Overhauser, and first demonstrated by Carver and Slichter in 1953 also, uh, but weren't verified uh, experimentally until 1962 by um, Freeman and Anderson. Now, NOE stands for Nuclear Overhauser Effect, named after Albert Overhauser, of course. And basically, if we take um, an uh, NMR uh, spectrum and we try and irradiate a particular proton, then we notice as that proton disappears because it's been brought to resonance, then anything within the vicinity of it um, will get this what's called nuclear overhauser enhancement or effect. And that can either be positive, leading to uh, an increase in the signal, or it can be negative, leading to a decrease. Now, if we look at scalar coupling, as shown here, the scalar coupling can spread throughout the bonds and can go all the way down a carbon chain to like five carbons along, as you see in um, uh, toxic uh, spectroscopy and stuff like that. NOE is restricted to about uh, between four and six angstroms in, in distance. I tend to think of it between four and five, something like that. Um, and it's a through space interaction, it's a dipolar coupling. Now, this restriction um, might seem uh, that we're quite limited in what we can do, but it's actually quite an advantage, especially when you're looking at the interaction of um, secondary structures or tertiary structures between proteins, or even even small molecule characterization looking at the stereochemistry. Now, the actual um, interaction is purely dominated by uh, the local fields of the nucleus. So as I've shown here, these two little bar magnets represent the source and the interesting spin. I'll explain what they are later on. And it's, it's that local interaction uh, that provides a mechanism for the, um, the relaxation of those particular nuclei, which then leads to an NOE effect. Okay, so let's have a look at the, the source or the origin of the NOE effect itself. So we take the ether uh, that we've been looking at, and we'll just introduce some nomenclature first. So the spin, the nucleus that we're going to actually radiate, uh, we'll call the source spin. So we'll label it as S. And the interesting spin, they're the spins that are going to be highlighted, if you will, by the radiation of the source spin. We'll call it I for interesting spin. And this is common nomenclature that's used. And this is for two nuclei which interact through space, so it's dipolar coupling and the separated uh, four, let's just say four angstroms it's separated by. Okay, so it's uh, pretty pretty close together. There's no scalar coupling. The oxygen uh, there in the ether um, kills all the scalar coupling that could go through the bonds. So if we now irradiated the source spin, so we've got an RF pulse, and we irradiate it at its Lamour frequency, basically at its resonance frequency, what will that do um, to, first of all, the source spin, and what will happen to the interesting spins? We're just going to look at the two-spin system that we've got here, the source spin and the interesting spin, so just these two hydrogen atoms. This is an energy level diagram which you should be familiar with by now. In the, the ground state, we should have both the nuclei as spin-up, and in the higher energy state, we should have both the nuclei as spin down. Spin down. I'm just going to label these now as source and, and interesting, because it will be very important for us when we're discussing the NOE effect. So I'll call that source and that interesting. And we have two other possible states that they can inter uh, these two spin states can uh, exist in, and that's if if the source spin flips, so that's the active spin and the interesting spin stays the same, then we can have this um, scenario where the source spin has flipped and the interesting spin is still up. And the source spin in that case is called the active spin and the, uh, the interesting spin which has done nothing is called the passive spin in that particular transition. So I'll just label them up again. And the other possibility, as you probably guessed, is that the source spin remains the same, that stays in the spin up state, and the interesting spin flips. Okay, so I'll just label them up. 
So we now need to think about the population of those particular states. So I'll just label that as source and interesting. Now just for sake of argument and to make it pretty easy to understand, we're going to imagine we've got something like 10 uh, molecules of this around or something like that. So if I take uh, the source spin, there'll be a lot more in the ground state because that's the lowest energy. So let's imagine we've got of these hydrogens, the source hydrogens, we've got six in that state. And I'll represent them as circles like this. And in the higher energy state, because it's the highest energy, well, let's just put one. And in the middle state there, let's, let's add three. And same with this. And similarly, for the interesting spin, because it's in the same molecule, it'll have six in the ground state, and so on, three there. Now I'm just making these up, just to prove a point. It's just a distribution, just like we get a distribution curve, Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution or something like that. This is just a distribution of the energy states in which the hydrogens can exist, the nuclei can exist. And I've just exaggerated it to make it look more obvious and hopefully help to uh, explain the uh, phenomena of the NOE effect. In the real um, uh, em environment or the real experiment, then there'd be something like uh, tens of millions of um, nuclei in one state, and obviously you've got Avogadro number of that as well, and in the upper state as well and there'd be a very very tiny difference but the the difference is what we detect and it's that population difference which gives rise to an NMR signal because we're looking for a difference in an, in the energies of the two states okay I waffled on a bit too much about that so we've got this distribution here we've got more in the ground state makes sense you got a little bit more in the next energy level state and in the higher energy state you've not got that Okay, so that's what I'm trying to prove here. Now that is for this two-spin system. That's as it stands. If you run a proton NMR, you end up seeing, if I draw this in, in blue, you'd see one spin there, one spin there like that. And it's supposed to be the same. It's just that I can't draw properly. And this would be the source spin. This would be the interesting spin. There's no coupling between the two because this is a dipolar coupling, so you don't get any spin. Splitting. There is dipolar coupling through space, but a proton NMR, normal proton NMR experiment won't show that up. You'll only see the transitions for these energy levels. So what happens when we irradiate the source spin? This is what the NOE effect's about. Irradiating the source spin redistributes the population of these states. So let's just have a look at that. This is the source spin here and this is also the source spin so we're looking at just this nucleus here for the source hydrogen we're not interested in the interesting spin at this point the effect of an RF pulse is to bring the source spin to resonance and in doing that it populates the upper state and populating the upper state to a point where you can't tell the difference between how many are in the bottom state and how many are in the upper state the the population difference there goes to zero so for in this particular example here the population difference at the beginning was plus two so you had more in the bottom state than the upper state at thermal equilibrium at the RF pulse puts everything in flux if you will so the upper states go into the top state, the top states go into the down state until it reaches a point where you can't tell the difference whether it's an upper state or down state and the, the population in the upper state has got more than normal and the lower state has got slightly less than normal so um, you can't tell uh, which state the nucleus is in once the RF pulse disappears the nucleus will try and regain its thermal equilibrium values in a natural process where it would then try and populate the ground state. 
that is the essence of the um, saturating the source spin. What we now need to do is have a look at the effect that saturating the source spin has on the interesting spin. So let's go back to our original diagram. If we, if we saturate the source spin, and I'll just get rid of these values for the source spin, because it's meaningless now, because you can't distinguish which state the source spin is in. It's in both states equally. But once it, the RF pulse has been applied, the source spin will try and go back to its equilibrium value. Now when it's the RF pulse is applied, it's got more in the upper state. So it will try and relax back down to its ground state to get back to that thermal equilibrium value. So let's have a look at the mechanisms by which the source spin in the upper state can go back down to its ground state. So first thing we need to do is have a look at where the, uh, the source spin is in the upper state. And the upper state is when it's pointing down, remember. So there's one there, and there's also one there. That's the high energy state for the source spin. The lowest state are here and here. Now it could it could go back down via its, its natural route uh, to give a, this signal here, or it's got options now. It can go across here, or it can go down here. If it goes down this uh, pathway from the higher energy state to the lower ground state, that's called a double quantum transition. And we denote that with a W and a number two. If it goes from it goes across there, it goes um, it's called a zero order quantum transition, and we denote that by a W and a zero. Now those are the two mechanisms by which you get the NOE effect. These are the only two that contribute to the nuclear Hohfeld's effect. So if we look at how that will affect the signal intensity of the interesting spin, then it should all make sense in a second why it increases or decreases depending on which pathway we choose. So let's have a look at this first pathway, which W2 pathway, the double quantum transition. Now this is um, normally a disallowed process in quantum mechanics because it involves a double transition. But in NOE we can detect it. So in doing this, the interesting spin is in the higher energy level and it flips to go into the lower energy level. So the relaxation of the source spin from its higher energy state out of thermal equilibrium back into its thermal equilibrium value, its relaxation from that drags the interesting spin into a different state. So that little value there, the only little value it had, disappears and increases the value in the ground state. By increasing the value in the ground state, it's actually increased the population difference. There is now a larger excess in the ground state than the upper state, so there's a bigger difference. That increase will give rise to an increase in signal because the, in the intensity of the signal is all dependent on the population difference. So the very fact that the source spin in this particular mechanism has gone from the upper state where the interesting spin was down to the ground state where now the interesting spin is up, it's added an up. It's got rid of a down spin for the interesting spin and added an up spin. So it's added m one more, if you will, to the population difference. So the signal intensity for that spin looks a bit bigger. And that's because it's just had a population inversion for that particular spin. So that's for the W2 or the double quantum transition. If we now have a look at the other pathway that's available for this. If you look at when this um, source spin flips uh, to its ground state in the W0 transition, the interesting spin this time is actually in its ground state, it's pointing up. 
So when the saucepan flips from its um, upper state to its ground state, the opposite happens now to the interesting spin and it points down, it's gone to higher energy level. So what that does, it actually decreases the population difference now because it's taking something from a ground state to the upper state and it's increasing this value here, decreasing it here. So basically if we had six on the bottom of it, as I've drawn and we had one at the top originally, we'd have a difference of five. But if we do this transition, we now will have two at the top and five at the bottom. So we've now got a difference of three. So the value has gone down. The population difference is now decreased. So in doing that, if I draw this in green, the W0 or the zero quantum transition event leads to a decrease in the signal intensity for the signal. Okay, and the dashed line there is where it originally um, had the intensity. So these two mechanisms, just draw that W a bit bigger, exist for NOE transitions, but in different circumstances. The W2 transition exists for small molecules, if you will. So if you're ever working with a small molecule, 500 or 1,000 Daltons, depending on the size of the magnet, but let's not go too much into the detail of this. For the general thought, if you will, is that if you're working with small molecules, typical organic compounds, then it's the double quantum transition mechanism that contributes to the signal intensity. If you're working with larger molecules, biomolecules like proteins, then it will be the W0 or the double, uh, sorry, the zero quantum transition mechanism that dominates. And that's why you get a decrease in signal intensity. So if you're looking for a difference in the spectrum, this one gives a positive effect and this one gives a negative effect. And if you're looking at um, NOEs in, in your compounds, or if you're even looking at the binding of a mole small molecule to a protein, for example, a ligand binding or something, then you can see if something's bound, for example, uh, because the small molecule binding to a protein will then tumble differently, and it's all to do with the tumbling. I'll do another video on, on the reason why the two mechanisms dominate in particular circumstances. And so you can you can actually get a lot of information about uh, how things are interacting with each other and molecular recognition events just by using NOE. There are obviously hundreds and thousands of different uses for NOE, and I do urge you to have a, a good look at them uh, in your studies. So hopefully this explained the the origin of the NOE effect and why you get an increase or a decrease. And if you've got any comments, um, please comment below and I'll try and answer them the best I can. I hope that I've explained the, um, the use of the population difference. If not, again, just ask me in the comments and I'll try and explain it in a better way. So that's it for now. Um, I'll put some screenshots and some worksheets and mind map maybe on Epistemio as, as soon as I can. Um, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Like I say, if you've got any comments, please put them in the comments section below. And until next time, bye for now.